Okay. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the great worship. Thank you for your sense of presence here. Yeah. Oh, we pray the Lord even as we speak the word. May the word of God come forth in all its glory. This is the word of the living God. Amen. We to bless our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We talked about uh, living out of the presence of God last week. Uh, we talked about the glory of God in the face of those today in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. But you know, it took a lot from God to bring that happen. In the old covenant, there was that, this, there was that uh, God showed his glory to Moses, right? As Moses said, show me your glory. And God showed uh, Moses the, uh, the glory, but he had to hide him in the cleft of the rock and cover him with the hand when he passed by. All he could see was the back of God, and he saw the glory of God. And just that caused his face to shine with glory. So when he come down, the people looked and they were terrified because of the glory of God. And it took God a lot, His only Son, and uh, to come down on this earth, to die on the cross, to be the intercessor for us, to intercede for us. And then when He died, then He could create this new heart. And with a new heart, He can put the Spirit of glory in us. That's why we read in Corinthians that now we have this ministry of the new covenant. You and I all have the ministry of the glory of God. And that glory shines from our face because His presence is in us now. And, and you know, we were singing the last song, you know, where it says that I'm desperate without you. And you know, even though the presence of God is fully in us, the Holy Spirit, sometimes we don't understand why God sometimes is with us, but He takes away the sense of His presence from us. Because I think He wants to he wants to develop in us such a heart for a constant uh, being in this presence that we long for the day of his coming. That we don't get so caught up in the world with all the happiness of the world, all the joy kind of thing that we, we take his presence lightly. So while he deep is like uh, there are seasons and times when God let us go through the valleys. And those valley times are tossing in us a desperation to see the presence of God. To see Jesus in the face, not by faith as believing now, but to see him face to face when he comes. Okay? That's the desperation God wants to cause us to come. That's what Jesus said when he was asked by the uh, by the disciples, uh, uh, I mean the Pharisees and the disciples of John, and said, we fast, but uh, how come your disciples won't fast? And Jesus said, how can they fast with the bridegroom with them physically? But the day will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast. And God's going to bring us to that place. I want to say this as a word that God wants to speak to us. God's going to bring us to a place of such desperation for the presence of God that we're going to go to fasting. Not because it's a ritual. Now oh, we must all fast on Wednesday now the church prayer meeting. But something that is just up inside us because we're so desperately want the presence of God. And when we go into that kind of a fasting, that is what the longing that uh, Romans chapter 8 says is that the whole creation is groaning for the revelations of the sons of God. That's what I understand. It's groaning for when Jesus Christ comes. When Jesus Christ comes, the sons of God will be revealed. We will be revealed for who we are. Romans chapter 8 says. And the whole of creation is groaning, waiting for that day when the sons of glory is going to come. So Matthew had a very important message. He was linking, he was linking this prophecy about the Messiah who will come, who will bring the glory of God. God's going to dwell, Emmanuel, God's going to be with man. Right? Not just only in Revelation when he actually near there fully when the new heaven and earth comes, but now Emmanuel, God has tabernacled with man. And when Jesus went back, he said his Holy Spirit, God is still tabernacled with us. And now the body of Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit, God's presence is present through you and me and through the church. And every church should recognize that we reveal the glory of God. So when we come back to Matthew, okay, let me just take you through some of the overview. We neglect him so much that we better make sure we know who he is. <laughs> Alright, chapter 1 to 3, we see Matthew wanting to connect Jesus with the Old Testament's Messiah. He's not just any teacher. He's the Messiah. And so we see the great son of David, son of Abraham. 
And then we see him fulfill the Messianic prophecies, the mangers of the manger, the virgin birth, born in Bethlehem, wise men from the east, Emmanuel, God with us. Chapter 1 to 3. Okay, that's what we get out of this now. Chapters 4 to 7, we see Jesus come. After his baptism, he came and announces the kingdom of God. He says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He confronts evil, he heals, he restores God's reign in his kingdom, and he creates a new family. That's the beginning. And within that chapter 4 to 7, 5 and 6 and 7, is Jesus teaching about his kingdom. Seven of the mouth. It's an upside down kingdom. Beatitude. This is his people. They live the beatitude. And they will fulfill the law through love. And he talks about transforming hearts to love. And okay, that's in chapter 47. Hopefully we remember all those things. So we took a little, a lot of detours to go into detail. But it's good to have over, overview so that when you read the Bible, you will know deeply what the thing is like that. Now we were at this block, chapters 8 to 10, where we see all the miracles as they bring to people's life. It's in triplets followed by a story about the Pharisee, the scribe, who says, we want to follow you, and Jesus talked about the price of uh, discipleship. Then the miracles of the stormy sea, having the storm, the demonized man, paralyzed man, followed by Matthew's calling, follow me, and Matthew followed. Then the issue of blood, the, the, the dead girl that was raised, the healing of two blind men, the mute man, okay? That's, he was, he was, he, he, Matthew outlined very clearly how Jesus begins to bring the kingdom of God into people's life. Okay? That the kingdom of God was invading the kingdom of darkness. Then there were a teaching block, a second teaching block about sending out his disciples, okay? sending out instructions. And we see people will accept, people will reject. That's where we are, that's where we fit in church. And this is where we are, a different color slide. Huh? Chapters 11 to 13, basically 11 and 12, will outline the different people's responses to the kingdom, to Jesus. Some of them were positive. He is the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. Some of them is unsure. Even John the Baptist is classified with, are you the Messiah? Is Jesus the Messiah? Negative, he's not the Messiah. And today we're going to look at this negative part. The scraps of the Pharisee and to see the conditions of heart that leads people to reject and to oppose Jesus. There are reasons why they oppose that. And then there will be the teaching block which we hope to get into. This will be interesting. Chapter 13, many of the parables of the kingdom are listed there. We're going to go keep parable by parable and learn principles about the parables of Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ. Uh. So today we're going into is Jesus is not the Messiah. And the scribes and the Pharisees and what condition your heart to reject Jesus like that. So we're going to play the video clip, uh, a scripture reading, always important to skip view the scripture, uh, look at the scripture. Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. And Jesus healed him, so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? 
Then he can plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven. But blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good, or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad, for a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers! How can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to them, who is my mother? And who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. I hope you follow the word clearly, because there's much to cover today. And uh, I want to finish chapter 12 so that we can start with the parables next week. And, uh, but there will be uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, observations that we want to pick, but uh, we're not going to be able to cover all this. Uh, if we have been doing all about the story and a quick perception of that, we would have a lot of a lot of things to learn from that about the realm of the spirit, about the spiritual world, about principles of the kingdom. But we're not here to do uh, all about the story. This may be part of one of the series we'll do next time. Right? But let's, let's just look at that. Uh, let's move on from here. Okay. So, subsection then. Uh, can this be the son of David? The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And when we were young, we always had this question people had. Have I blasphemed the Holy Spirit? Have I committed that unforgivable sin? <laughs> and a lot of people were rather worried about that. No? So uh, I wonder whether anybody ever worry about whether you have committed that unforgivable sin. Eternally never forgiven. That means eternally separated from God. 
specific, important to do that. Yeah. But let's just look at the uh, scripture. Now, I don't have the scripture, maybe with you, uh, you have not learned the scripture, so I hope you follow trend of the thoughts. Yeah. So this is the situation when a blind man, a, a demon oppressing man, who was both blind and knew, he was brought before Jesus, and Jesus healed him, and the man spoke and saw. That was the act of power. Jesus healed the man. We will look at the situation here, that uh, was he blind and mute because he was possessed, or was he already blind and mute and had oppression as well, uh, demonic? But whatever the case, whichever is the cause, we don't want to speculate in that. But we want to know that when Jesus cast out the demon, the man will begin to see and to, uh, and to speak. Perhaps it could have been connected. Some physical ailments, physical sickness could be demonically uh, inspired, right? But not necessarily everything like that, right? So, and the people were amazed. Think of it, whenever that is a power gift, people are amazed and they ask this question, can this be the son of David? So this is a positive response. They were not sure yet, they say, can this be the son of David? And now, of course, the term son of David really explained it, mind you. The people were expecting the Messiah to come, and the Messiah comes from the line of King David. There's going to be a king sitting on the throne of Israel. So is this the son of David? And the believer at the time when the son of David come will be, he will do great miracles and acts of power. He will liberate them from the Romans. So the people say, can this be the son of David? A very positive. So why do some people see a miracle and have a, a very positive uh, 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 response to a Not sure yet. And uh, maybe what will be needed will be further, further teaching and understanding that they know who, why he is the son of David, why Jesus is the son of God, but still a very positive response. Huh? Then we look at the Pharisees. When the Pharisees heard it, they said, it's only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this man cast out demons. Having met people who, when they see, when a Christian does something and they see a power of God, they will not admit the power of God, they will say something else about it. Okay? So this is what happened. So I want to ask this question. This is a negative response leading to rejection. A very negative response. You see the miracle? I mean, obviously this man was demon possessed. Obviously he was blind. He was, uh, he was not able to speak. But when this man was healed by this person called Jesus, then they turn around and say this, and they attribute his source of power to Satan. So, why the two responses? We will look at it as we examine the heart. The issue of every matter is the heart. Yeah? Okay, we'll examine the heart later. Why people can come up with something was already happening for the uh, Jesus was really known, okay? But he did all those miracles that we saw in chapter 8 and uh, 9 and 10 in those places there. The scribes and Pharisees, huge crowd followed Jesus. They already know what Jesus stands for, that he says he stands by God. They know that. But something was in their heart that prevented them from receiving Jesus as God. And in fact, as they look at the scripture, we realize that they were very much threatened in their position. All right, the position as the leaders of Israel was being threatened. Okay. So let's look at Jesus. He knows their thoughts. Now that's the wonderful thing about the law. Yeah? We can try to hide everything in our hearts, but He knows our thoughts. He knows our thoughts. He says to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. Okay? Now, when Jesus says something like that, uh, that's a principle, that's an observation that we must learn. And if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? So the first thing I want you to learn as we go through this observation is that Jesus said very clearly, any kind of division will result in the fall of that institution. 
whether it's a kingdom, whether it is a nation, whether it is a company, whether it's the church. Every time there's division, it will result in the fall of an institution. So that's a spiritual principle. That's why uh, Jesus talks about the people of God being united, united around the mission of God. Paul corrects the division in the church in Corinth because it was breaking up. Okay? So that's a principle that we must all learn that we, if there's division, that it will cause the fall of the division of the nation. So observation one that we, that we look at Peter uh, at Matthew uh, recording what Jesus said. So the lesson if we if we understand that the principle we need to application of our life is that we always need to engage, all right, and learn to work together to fulfill the purpose of that kingdom, the purpose of that organization, so that it is not divided, right? So we'll look at what the kingdom of God stands for and why Jesus later on said that. Right? If you don't gather with him, you scatter. If you're not with me, you're against me, right? So his kingdom stands for something. The kingdom of God stands for something. His invasion of God's life into the darkness and the, and, the, and the death of the world that Satan has brought the world into. And if it's a spiritual warfare, it's a battle between two kingdoms. Of course, the kingdom of God that we see will always be stronger. So, so when when the when the scribes and Pharisees said, "You cast out demons by Beelzebul," then he points out the illogical the, uh, statement they made. He says, "How can Satan cast out Satan? Because if Satan cast out Satan, obviously his kingdom will crash, will be desolate. So, if I cast out demons, obviously it's not by Satan himself. So then you got to ask yourself." By what power? But they were not willing to attribute the power to God. So they were trying to force it on to the people. The people said, Is this the son of David? They said, No, he has not given by this rule. He's not the son of David. He's not God. So they were oppressed. They were going against that. And Jesus asked another question. Jesus always asked questions. You say, I cast out demons by this rule. He said, If your sons cast them out, if I cast out demons by those people, by whom do your sons cast them out? Now, at that time, the people of Israel, there were people involved in the exorcism as well, casting out demons. So he turned around to them and said, If you say I cast out by those people, then what about all your Israelite people who do deliverance? Are they casting out by, um, by those people? Definitely not, because they say that this is God's power working through them. Okay? And you remember the Acts of the Apostles, uh, uh, there were the seven sons of Siva, Siva. You know, so they were Jewish practitioners of deliverance as well as the uh, Okay? So he says, your own sons will be your judges, your own children, children of Israel will be your judge. And then he says, if I did cast out demons by those who if I by the Spirit of God, if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then what is happening? The kingdom of God has come on you. Now I don't think Jesus is just only meaning deliverance to the street. It means by the Spirit of God that he not only cast out demons, but he heals the sick. Whenever there's an invasion, he responds to the broken-hearted, like he brings the woman uh, who, who was uh, brought to God before him, caught in the doubting and released her. When he ministered and set people free, you know, the woman with the issue of blood. When all these things are done by the power of God, it's the kingdom of God invading into people's life. So this is the issue that today we all live with. How is the kingdom of God invading our city, for example? How are we bringing? Do when we see people come into this kingdom through the removal of blindness, that's an act of the power of the Holy Spirit. People are coming in. Whether they believe because they saw a healing or they believe because the Holy Spirit convicted them, whatever it is, somebody is liberated from the power of Satan. 
So the kingdom of God has come upon you. But Jesus was specifically saying that, that this is the day of the visitation. Later on, Jesus in Matthew was saying, he wept over Jerusalem. He says, if only you have known the day of the visitation. But that is hidden from you. He was going to prophesy the judgment. They were going to crucify him. He was hidden. Now was not yet the time where he was hidden. Now the kingdom of God was coming in power. And people have to make choices. You know, sooner or later, everybody has to make a choice and make a conclusion. Is he the son of God or is he not? If we present our, the gospel clearly, effectively, with the power of the Lord breaking uh, blindness in people's lives, if people are brought into the stage of knowing who Jesus is and still reject him, then that's an issue. All right? If they see that happening and they say, maybe he's a son of God, yeah, he's a person of peace that God is working with. Okay? So there are going to be people who will outright reject God for whatever reason. So but Jesus said, this can only happen. He can, this can only happen that the kingdom of God invades the kingdom of darkness because someone stronger than the strong man had been bound. <coughs> Then he had planted his house. All right. The strong man, the strong man, first refers to Satan. Satan has the world under control. And we will need a stronger man to come and bind him. Okay? Now, this doesn't teach us to go around everywhere binding spirit all the place. At one time, people were going to temples wanting to bind the spirit of the temple. That's not what we're called to. The binding of Satan had been done on the cross of Jesus Christ. Okay, when he died there, he was bound. And that's why we can now plunder okay, his kingdom. Okay? So Jesus is saying, this is going to happen. And you guys have been confronted with the power of the Holy Spirit. And yet, straight away, the first thing you say, when people say, is this the son of David? You want to discourage them? And you say, no. He uses the power of Satan to, to deceive you all, to cast up his demons. But Jesus said, you are illogical. How can Satan be divided? But if true, I use the power of the Holy Spirit. If I by the Spirit of God, uh, he, he doesn't say he himself do it. Just in case we all think that, for well, I'm not Jesus, I can't. He says, by the Spirit of God. And we are a generation where Jesus died on the cross. We receive the Spirit of God inside us. And now we can all do the same. That none of us should be afraid of demons. We should be able, when we have to deal with the demonic forces, we have to be able to break the power of Satan over a person, over a situation. So unless it was binds. So Jesus was coming as the stronger man that God has said, and he was working in the nation. But I'm not going to depend now on the, for the nation's, the, the generation, the nation's uh, uh, deliverance or continuance in the uh, bondage. We all have to depend on how you look at the person of Jesus Christ. So you can see here, at the very beginning stage, before the Passion Week, the minds of the Pharisees were already settled. He cannot be of God. Whatever power you all see, it comes from Satan himself. Observation two, which I will list down like what it says. Let's all let's all add it into our spirit. The spirit of God who is within in us is that stronger man. He's stronger than anything outside. You have a problem? Jesus, the Spirit of God in you is stronger than the problem. We may not understand why something he why sometimes he doesn't seem to answer us. And that's the struggle Christians have. When it seems that God is not answering us when we pray, and the, the heaven is like grass, is quiet, silent. But I mean it may sound like a trite phrase, but that's true. Whenever God doesn't answer, doesn't mean God doesn't care. 
There could be other reasons. He could be training us. He could be changing. Like James, those of you, one of the books from the two James, some book of that, it says that all these persecution, all these trials are to strengthen our muscles of endurance. So that when you are strengthened, then you have, you become perfect. And then you have everything. So sometimes your loneliness, sometimes your brokenness, sometimes God has received the answers from your prayer. It's because God is strengthening your endurance muscle. We don't like it. We don't like it when you persist through that. But I just say, stand on the fact that God's Spirit is with us. That Jesus, Jesus the Holy Spirit, is the stronger man. Okay? The second observation in that. We continue this thing that was initiated by the Pharisees coming against Jesus. And that gave Jesus a wonderful opportunity to teach, to show people the heart of the Pharisees. Then he says something, Jesus said. And this is in direct reference to the scripture of Pharisees. Says, Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. Okay, let me, let me stop with this, huh? Jesus came with a mission, right? If we are with him in his mission, okay, if we are with him, okay, good thing, good. whoever is not with me is against me. Meaning that if you don't work in the purpose of God, you end up working against the purpose of God. Right? Now, I want you to look at another verse, okay, Luke chapter 9, verses 49 to 50. They were, they were in a certain village going to Jerusalem. John answered, Master, we saw one come and casting out demons in your name. We tried to stop him because he does not follow us. But Jesus said, you do not fight him, for the one who is not against you is for you. Now, how does that discuss? I want you to just tell me. Does this two statement of Jesus conflict? Okay, go back to the first one now. Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me is scatters. Now he says next, do not, for the one who is not against you is for you. How do you reconcile this two statement? It's the same, eh? Why, why do you say it's the same? Because if you're not with me, you're against me. If you're not against me, you're with me. It's the same, eh? Oh, I mean, okay. These are two different situations. Okay, uh, all right. It, it, it does not conflict. We are for sure. Jesus will not teach something that conflict. Can why you frown? Tell me what you mean. <laughs> okay, let's look at the first one again. Huh? Jesus is talking about himself. Did not make me. They against me. He actually says you cannot sit on the fence. If you're not with me, you're against me. If you don't come along with me, if you don't gather with me, you will scatter. So the idea here is that we must go with Jesus, right? So that's true. Uh, I don't think it is anything wrong. It's not us. No. But the next thing here is that uh, this group of people were not with them, right? They were separate people. They were casting out demons, but also in the name of Jesus. Okay? In the name of Jesus. Whether they saw Jesus doing it and they wanted to use the name of Jesus or, and do it, we don't know. But they were not. So, and, and, and John and his, his brothers wanted to stop them. You're not with us, right? You're not with us. But Jesus said, well, we're not against you. It's for you. Alright. Here, the idea is that they were doing it with Jesus. They were using the name of Jesus. But not of the same group together. Now this, this verse tells us about the danger of what we call sectarianism. Huh? You're not in my church. Huh? You're my enemy. <laughs> You're that church. So I cannot. No, but they, they're doing things in the name of the Lord. That's how you got it. We are always very careful that we don't... Uh, uh, separate and say we're different, okay? and uh, but of course it doesn't mean that uh, like Paul, like, like Paul pointed out the error of Peter, he did. Yeah. Paul pointed out the error of Peter because this is the book of Galatians. 
One time Peter came to the Gentile and then he got so carried away with the Judaism and the people of Judaism. He did not want to eat with the Christians because he says, I'm a Jew. He didn't want to eat with them. He forgot, he forgot the vision that God gave him. I remember the great ship that came down and yeah. yeah. remember the story of the whole town. Yeah, all yeah. the animals yeah. kind of thing. He forgot the vision where God said, well, that's what I planned is no more complete. So, Galatians chapter 3 of Paul, Paul rebuilt Peter. He says, how can you do that? We have broken down the law so that we, the Gentiles can come. And now you're building up the wall again to separate ourselves from the Gentiles. Right? So, whoever is not against us, that means not against the mission of God. We stand for the mission of God, but we're with Jesus. If they are with the mission of Jesus as well, they are not against us. Because sometimes people say, when they don't look at this carefully, they say it's not contribution. Yeah? So we'll discuss that. Huh? Now, after this, huh? after this statement about the principalities, about uh, how can Satan cut for this Satan, and I cut out for the power of God, and uh, because I'm the stronger person who binds Satan. Huh? Then Jesus addresses the issue of what the scribes and Pharisees said. You by the those by those who cast out demons. They were attributing the source of Jesus' power, not to the Holy Spirit, but to the demons. And Jesus said, Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Either in this age or in the age to come. It's a very serious sin, you know. That's why a lot of young people say, Oh, have I have I committed an unforgivable sin? Because at one time they spoke against the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and at one time they said, you know, so they feel that they have violated that unforgivable sin. So we wanted to settle that today. Yeah? What does it mean to speak against the Holy Spirit? That's leading to the sin of blasphemy against the spirit. So first thing, what does the word blasphemy mean? Yeah, what's the word? Ah, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's a good story to raise that. <laughs> blasphemy, according to Miriam Webster, means insulting, showing contempt or lack of reverence to God. So you can show contempt towards God is a blasphemy. That's why the, uh, the uh, that is this law in uh, Thailand about what less majesty is. Yeah. They see the, the king has gone. Huh? So if you say something against the, the blaspheme against the king, you can get punished. Even for the Muslims, for the Jews today, uh, blasphemy against God, you speak evil against God. You can speak, and, and here, Jesus is saying, you can speak bad, you can insult, you can call curse God, you can curse Jesus. That sin can be forgiven. But, you cannot, as he says here, speak against the Holy Spirit. Now, what does he mean speak against the Holy Spirit? Because at one time or other, when you're not a believer, you would have said something, you kind of thing, so you have a committed and forgivable sin. If you have, you won't be in this congregation. <laughs> this is the congregation of the forgiven. <laughs> so, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is when you take the true work of the Holy Spirit and you speak evil of it. You see, what was happening was that Jesus knew the structure and the Pharisees knew exactly who he was. Okay? They know that it was through the Holy Spirit that God was doing his power. Okay? And yet, they will not admit it because they have other reasons. They will protect their own organization kind of thing. They were deliberately speaking evil, saying that this is the devil. And it's not a one-time thing, as he says, an ongoing rejection of the work of the Holy Spirit, attributing this precious work to Satan himself. Because remember that uh, Jesus healed, and then he said, "It's not the Spirit of God; it is the Spirit of Satan." He said to himself, "He does this." So, and they didn't do it in blindness. They didn't do it because they didn't know it. Sometimes people can say things like that, but they don't know. It's not yet a blasphemy. But 
when you already recognize that Jesus is God, by whatever we, uh, things that God has done for you, and you know He's God, you know the Spirit of God is God, and yet you were to say that whatever He does in power is not God, it's Satan, deliberately doing it. Let's move on. It's important to note that this sin is not committed accidentally or unknowingly. Okay? It involves a conscious and deliberate rejection of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> you see, all sins can be forgiven. That's what the Bible says. Huh? What's the key to forgiveness? Fill in the blank. What's the key? What's the key to forgiveness? Is available, but you still don't get it until you repent. repent. That's why we have to be very careful about once forgiven, once saved, always saved, and also for, uh, that uh, uh, once God forgives you, future sins also forgiven. You know, but that's not true. First John says that if we commit sin, we come again to cleanse it. It's not like one time everything is done. The provision for grace for all time is available. But the key to it is repentance. Repentance is not just saying, I am sorry. Repentance is turning away. So if you say the grace of God forgives you everything, you're no longer judged, and you continue doing that sin, there's no repentance. And you will deceive yourself and say, oh, there's no repercussion for my sin. That's the danger of the super grace. People will think that it's not forgiven. But as they can't overcome it, they don't have the incentive to overcome it. Because it's all forgiven. God has dealt with it. There's no more judgment. So people can continue in sin. That's why Romans say, should I continue to sin because the grace of God is available? No. The key is repentance. What's the key to repentance? Recognizing God's Holy Spirit. Give me one word. Yeah, let, let, let me know. It's very bad that we have been going through uh, three point nine a quarter of a message today. Conviction. You see, I may know this sin, I may know I need to repent. May not be convicted to repent. I may feel that it's okay, I can go on. Conviction, alright? Something must happen inside us for me to know. That's why sometimes people can say all oh, the Christian thing, eh? can, uh, can agree on all, everything, eh? but yet there's no repentance. Because there's no conviction in the heart of the holiness of God. No conviction inside us of the sinfulness of man. So we continue saying the right thing and going back to it and going back to our whole life because the conviction is not there. Now conviction is a very powerful thing. When the conviction happens is that you just were like, oh Lord. Like like this, uh, right? when he went fishing, when the Lord went out in the boat with them fishing and cast them, cast the right side and he saw the huge catch. First time Peter and John was uh, uh, Peter and Drew and John and, and then James was called. When Peter saw that, he fell at the feet of Jesus and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. That's from the church. As long as you think, I'm okay, I'm not as, I'm not as bad as the next person, I'm okay. But as long as you think like that, that, you won't change your life. When you realize that you have really, really offended God, conviction. So the next thing we'll ask yourself is, What's the source of conviction? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Wow, this is a very clever <laughs> So you see the process, right? Yes, all sins can be forgiven. But the key is repentance. But how do you get the repentance? Conviction. How do you get conviction? Holy Spirit. Now what happens when you constantly go against the Holy Spirit and don't accept him as the Holy Spirit? When the person blasphemes, slanders, rejects the true work of the Holy Spirit. 
they disconnect themselves from the source of conviction. And when this happens, nothing, no one can move the person to repentance. Without repentance, they can be more forgiven. It's a very simple explanation. I love it. It's okay. You have to understand. When somebody, or like, I think it was in Thessalonians where they say, men who sear their conscience and are unable to repent. They have come and they have, uh, they have they have taken the pure things of God and they reject the Holy Spirit and whatever things they say and do when they disconnect themselves from the work of the Holy Spirit like the scribes and Pharisees were already doing. See, when Jesus came, He did make attempts to reach the scribes and Pharisees but it's not that He saw them as the enemy and straight away didn't want to uh, uh, but to deal with them. Because one time there was a, a man that was healed in the early stages. And Jesus said, don't tell anybody, but go to the priest and show them. So that they will pronounce over you the cleansing from that sin. He wanted that power and the sort of it be known by the priest. But the Bible class says this leper went around tell everybody. And so there was so much uh, attraction to Jesus that he was no longer able to minister in the town but he had to go to the wilderness side of minister because the crowd was coming. Jesus cares for all. But it looks like this group of people have come to a place where they have uh, so, their heart has been so nurtured by them uh, that uh, they are not wanting the light of God to come through. Okay, I want us to consider the heart. Can this be the son of David? That's our title. We've seen, we've seen the, 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 the encounter between the Pharisees and Jesus. And now Jesus begins to change the topics, to speak. If you, if you don't connect it, you'll wonder why is he speaking something like that. And he's actually telling the crowd, he's telling the crowd, and that's it. That is, he says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. But the tree is known by its fruit. Okay. So let's take another explanation. <coughs> We're doing in the sense a little bit of uh, uh, SDN. So. A tree is known by its fruit simply means that a person's action in the moment when it's not a calculated action by acting. You know, actors live in a very dangerous world. People who are actors, all right, play acting. <coughs> Because sometimes they can play act so much that they don't know their real self. They can pretend so well that people can say, oh man, yeah. and then it's actually just acting. We're talking about person's action when he is not pretending to be somebody, he's not trying to project something. That means when the person is not uh, trying to uh, cover up something. Uh, that person's action caught at the moment when he is not pretending reveals his true character in the inner nature. That's why you have this famous saying, people say, you know, if you want to know uh, about the pastor, uh, his life, you know, ask his wife. <laughs> because they know him at home. When no one else is looking around, if he's pretending, the wife knows. Of course, he can. So I think the wife, don't tell anybody <laughs> anything, right? but it's true. Every one of us like, will live a kind of life that other people look at. But a tree is known by its fruit. When, our, when we are not putting up a defense, we're not pretending, and the way we act, the way the things we speak, the things we say, reveals the heart. Yeah. And the heart's very important. Okay? Now, what then does Jesus say mean by make the tree good and its fruit good? Make the tree bad and its fruit bad. He's telling the scribe of Pharisees, you have a choice. You can make that tree good or you can make the tree bad. And once you do whatever it is, we will know the tree by its fruit. Don't have to pretend on that. So, of course, the word tree is not go to a papaya tree and then try to do something in that sense. It's symbolically referred to people. So what does it mean to make the tree good? How do we make the tree good? How do you make a person good and make a person bad? Good question, isn't it? 
So then come this question, uh, even the psychologists, psychiatrists are talking about nurture or nature. Born like that, or is it environment that brings you to like that? Okay? So what do you think? What's your thoughts? Is it all nature? That means you born evil, you definitely will become evil? Is it nurture? Nurture plays a part. So is it possible then to nurture somebody so that without sin? No, no, no. We have to be careful, right? Nature, nurture. They're, they're two parts, they are intertwined. The first thing about nature is that we are born with that inherent nature of sin. Hey, let me just not run through that uh, uh, jump ahead. Uh. Making a tree good or bad refers to the cultivation of one's inner character. A good tree produces good fruit because it's healthy and well nourished. A person who cultivates virtues such as love, kindness, honesty will produce good actions that reflect the inner character. Now, that's nurture. That, nothing to do now with nature, whether we are in heaven, sin or not. But it does mean this. That's why there are some very good people out there who are not safe. You agree with me? There are some people who are very kind, very loving, and yet they're not saved because the issue is not whether you're good or not. Uh, the issue of whether your sins, your, 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 your life has been forgiven. The sins have been forgiven. Because some people get mixed up and say, why oh, Christians? Uh, some Christians are so terrible, but the non-Christians are better and they speak as if we're trying to. Uh, yes, that is true because we have not nurtured. Some Christians have not nurtured their life. From young, either because of uh, uh, the way the parents, the family was growing up. Okay, so they get very badly damaged. Now, okay, I'll leave over the before down because. On the other hand, a bad tree produces bad fruit because it is unhealthy and neglected. In the same way, a person who neglects his inner character or indulges in vice such as hate, drug, greed, or deceit will produce actions that reflect the inner state. Now, we always hear of, we always hear of, uh, Transformation, right? Yeah. Yes, nurture can decide whether we go this way or go that way. And some of us have very bad nurturing in the past. We make very bad choices. By the grace of God, God changed our nature. Then we must start nurturing, right? That's why we have to add to ourselves kind of virtues, right? Remember the famous verse in First Peter or Second Peter, it says that. So that we uh, by the we have all the promises in the divine word of God and the word of God we must add on. So save, but add on. Add on virtues. Add on virtue. Some Christians don't add on virtue. That's why they may be, they may be saved, but as far as the world looks at them, they, they are just a bad testimony. So this battle of virtue. So when Jesus says, make the tree good or make the tree bad, and the tree. And, and that has repercussion towards the salvation of the people. People who have nurtured their life in the ways of good eh, are like people of peace. I think in the example of Cornelius, right? Uh, many of those people are not believers. But the story about Cornelius and how God sent an angel to him and said, Call for Peter. And Peter came and preached the message and they accepted the gospel. God saw, he says, that your God-fearing attitude and your, and your kindness to the poor, your gift to the poor, has reached God. So, I think there are people out in the world where they have nurtured their hearts. Not saved yet. There's inherent sinful nature inside. Like not saved yet. But they, so they have become whole. They have become not holy in the sense of pure before God, but they become good. They walk in love. And God looks out for people like that and sends the gospel to them. In a sense, these are the people of peace, right? And uh, yeah, I remember, I remember, uh, what's the doctor's name who joined us from the old Asian pastor? Dr. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Very steep in Buddhism and uh, steep in the uh, uh, hip hop. I don't know what that, some, some of them. And uh, 
when he had that experience with God, that he struggles later on with his with, with his philosophy, and uh, but he was he understood because there's much in Buddhism that speaks about being a good person, right? It doesn't conflict with Christianity when it speaks when Christianity talks about uh, being good. Okay? So these are the nurturing things that take place, but. Sometimes when that happens, a person may think that I am good enough to save our son. That's where the problem happens. Okay? That's when the veil of the law covers their eyes. Why do I say the veil of the law? What's the veil of the Ten Commandments? The veil of the commandment that Moses had, the people had to, that they could not see the grace of Jesus Christ was that veil that covers them. They see, cannot see the face of Christ because that was the veil that tells them that I do the right things and I do the good things. I'm saved. I'm good enough. And that veil exists over non Jews also because so many of us believe the same thing. If I do the right thing, if I do, then God will accept me. And that makes it difficult for us to see the grace of God. The grace of God says your good things won't save you. Only what he's doing on the cross says. Excuse me, I have a question. Because you yes. said that the Buddhism and the Christianity are doing good, but the big difference about people who are doing good, I believe we have an ulterior motive of doing good for the Lord Jesus. But the Buddhism have an ulterior motive. They are doing good to receive more good. That's a big difference. So they are, they are doing good is actually off what but, biblical way. Yeah, that's true. That's why I said at the end of the day, yeah, uh, they're not saved because the purpose in doing it is to earn salvation for ourselves. Whereas the purpose we do it is because we've been made good, so we do good works. But I'm saying is that yeah, there are people out there who are very kind, very gracious. And so it's a nurture. Now, the power of nurture is important, what I'm saying, the power of nurture. Jesus says, make a good tree good. How do you do that? By nurturing. Nurturing. Okay? So let's move on further. So, we are born into this world of a sinful nature, an inner propensity to do evil or to become evil. Okay? When Hitler was born, I think he was a lovely child. But <laughs> <laughs> Stanley was born, I think he's a chubby little boy that the mother loved. Right? Yes. But it's nurture that drives how far one goes down the road of evil. Okay? We're all on the road of evil because we're born with that. But the upbringing, the philosophy we get into drives us further down the road. The killing fields of Cambodia, the idea came from France. When, uh, I, forgot, I forgot the name of that. Oh, no, maybe not the killing fields, but yeah. They went and learned Lenin Marxism from, uh, from the European countries to come back wanting to create the perfect uh, society for the people. But without God, you know? and um, the way the means, okay, the, the ends justify the means. So in other words, they end up killing to get what they want. The ends justify the means. So, nurture drives how far a person goes down the road with people. For Hitler and Stalin, if you can read, sometimes it's very interesting for us to read the biography of these men, huh? what made them what they are. You'll find by ideas they get the beginning, the childhood people. So, but the wonderful thing is this is that uh, this nature that we have is transformed by the grace of God. Uh. Okay, let's see how we deal with both nature and nurture. The process of transformation of the heart change. Anyone understand justification? What is justification? Okay, and what does it do for us when we still in Jesus? Peace of God. Peace of God. God. One more thing. Peace of God is that we are justified by faith. So that we are now peace with God. Eh? Yeah. But what makes for peace with God? Jesus made Christ for us. 
Jesus paid the price for us. Sorry? Jesus already paid the price for us. Yes. So he justified us and forgives us sin. Justification talks about he made us right, justified before God. That means uh, he made us righteous so we have peace with God. Okay? Without righteousness, there's no peace with God. Okay? Righteousness, and this justification is salvation. Uh, where he comes and he takes our hardened heart, heart of stone, he takes it away, then he puts in the his Holy Spirit. He gives us a new nature. That's what the Bible says. He gives us a new nature, the nature of God. And now uh, we are now righteous before God, but we still have the old man inside us, right? We still have the old nature inside us. Paul talks a lot about the old man and the new man and how the old man and the new man has a battle inside us. Uh, so what you feed is what gets strong. When you feed the old man with the things of the world, the lust of the flesh, he gets stronger, he strangles your new nature. The new nature will not be. So, the next stage is sanctification. What is sanctification? It's the conviction by the Holy Spirit, daily conversation. Okay. It's, it's the conviction of the Holy Spirit as He works in our heart to set us apart, make us holy. That sanctification is a process where, from the time we're justified and saved, God is in the process of sanctifying us so that when He comes again, when Jesus comes again, we'll be just like Him. He is purifying us. And that sanctification process is actually done by the Word of God coming to our life, nurturing us, and the fruit of the Spirit being brought forth, we begin to love, we begin to make choices, to do the right things, not to help lies, not to have greed. And so we slowly sanctifying, setting us apart and making us pure. That's a process that takes place today. And the final one, this is in Romans chapter 8, the final one is glorification. When Christ comes back, then we glorify, we totally love Him. Then there's no more sin in our nature. Alright? So this is what happens. When Jesus died for us, He dealt the death blow to our sinful nature. He took away our sin. He gave us a new, new heart. And the seed of God's blood is planted in you. So we are new nature. Now between that time we have had salvation to the time when we become totally like God in our resurrected body is a process of sanctification. That process is when the Holy Spirit nurtures us, right? With His Word, with His uh, instruction, transforming our mind, making us think new again. Making us renewed, all right? So, that's why, if you want to make a tree good, now, let's go back to the word, and we, oh, we're almost ready. Make the tree good. So there are two things we need to do to make the tree good. For us today, come to Jesus, deal with the nature. Second, start the process of adding to the word of salvation, the virtues of God for us. Okay. For those whose nature were not born again, but they started the process of nurture, it looks like uh, the other people who are likely to say, is this a son of God? There's nothing inside them that is against God. They're looking for good, they're looking for virtue, they're looking for right behavior. When they're confronted with the things of God, they probably will ask his sister, this other person is a priest I look for. Now, if a person that's nature is bad, but he's nurtured it, as we look at it, as we saw it, that he nurtured it with all kinds of uh, hatred, greed, deceit, and all kinds of things. Uh, it's got a big problem. Confronted to the truth, he may attribute it to the devil. Right? Now, of course, does that mean these people cannot be saved? Give me an example of a man who was saved even though uh, he was very anti Jesus Christ in the Bible. Paul. Paul. Right? Okay. But Paul was a different Pharisee from the other Pharisee. He was always zealous for God. He was nurtured his heart in the right way. He nurtured his heart to do the will of God. That's why when he knew, when he thought 
that this group of people were going against the God, the true God, he went to persecute them. This wasn't because, you know, I was perfect by tradition, kind of thing. So, so generally, I, I know this doesn't completely explain the whole thing of why this way good, but I would think it's important for us, especially now with the believer, to nurture the way of good, so that the way fruit can become seen, uh, can be seen. You know? Because Jesus then goes on to say, how can you speak good when you are evil? But the out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. Okay? So, observation four, we speak out of the abundance of the heart. Okay? So, the nature, the nurture works together to make the heart what it should be. Right? If we be filling our hearts as a child of God with the, with the values of the kingdom of God, with the values of God, then we speak out the things that are from God. The Pharisees and scribes speak out of a heart that was abundant with evil and, and animosity towards uh, the things of God. Right? Very quickly, when a person has good treasure in his heart, he brings out good things. Same thing, huh? when an evil person brings out evil, he's bringing out of his evil treasure. Again, the treasure refers to the content of the heart. So, have the nature done good by being believing, but then you have to nurture, because you can have a divided kind of thing, eh? where you're neither here nor there. Now, that's where I want you to look at James. No man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil, full of evil poison. We will be blessed our God and our Father, and we will be men will be made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth to see blessing and cursing, but brethren, this thing ought not to be so. Does a spring send, send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brother, bear olives or a grapevine bear fruits? No spring yields both salt, water, and fresh. Now, observation number five. Right? That tongue can never be tamed. Even as a Christian, it cannot be tamed. What you do is not to tame the tongue. What you do is transform the heart. When you transform the heart, the tongue will always speak from the abundance of the heart. So you're not supposed to, we're not asked to train the tongue. It's a very powerful thing that you can speak, kind of thing. But if your abundance of your heart is good, you speak good, then it provides your whole body. <clears throat> but if your heart treasure is evil, it will come up. If not in the moment when we're pretending, but in the moment of when we're not pretending, then we know the fruit. The okay. was in the heart. Okay? Agree. Agree, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so tongue cannot be tamed. So if you try to bite your tongue, try to change your tongue, this will change your heart. True. Because so now. When we look at the verse then just now it says that uh, how then can a Christian bless God, worship God, go up, curse man? Can can one spring, even the natural uh, one spring, uh, can you have both uh, what kind of water? Fresh water. Sand frost? No, you either come up with fresh or come up with salt. So if you were coming up with both, uh, you're gonna ask yourself, you got the split personality. <laughs> It's not really a split personality. I think that it's the, the, the fight between who controls the heart, the old nature to the new nature. You have to nurture the new nature. Okay, let's move on from here. A good person out of this good treasure brings off good, evil does not the way that. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every palace you will speak, for by your words you will be justified, by your words you will be condemned. Now, I want you to put a little bit of explanation on that. Right? Callous words. What are callous words? Callous words are spoken, springs out spontaneously, not guarded words. Now we can guard our words. Oh, yeah, you're yeah, a good, nice person. There's some how later on you plow. Callous word. Now, what does a callous word reveal? The heart. When you don't guard your words and you speak out of your heart, that tells you what kind of person. And Jesus is saying that. The heart that you reveal, you're going to be judged by the heart. 
How do we tell us what we speak? Okay, we'll review it correct. Okay, well, I, I'm going to move very quickly. Actually. Never mind that. They talk to the Smaller group, they talk with that. Can you speak the son of David? Yeah, but I know that we need to have a lunch, man. <laughs> okay, the next thing, can you speak the son of David? So now, this part of the Pharisees, that after Jesus had come down there, uh, they said, Give me one son. He still wants a more son of David. Uh, so his grandfather has him. Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. Prove to us, prove to us you are the Messiah. But Jesus said that he disagrees his story. An evil and adulterous generation, he called them, you're a bad tree. Yeah? You see for a sign, no sign will be given to you except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Right? Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the valley of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart. You know what happens when Jesus said on the Revelation 6? But those whose hearts are evil, God will not give any other sign to convince them. He won't. That's how some people say, oh, you know, we, we need to do all kinds of No, God says, only one sign you do. You have to consider that. But Jesus died on the cross. Because Jonah, three days and three nights, in the way of the it's a picture of Jesus being three days and three, uh, of his death, his burial, right? Only one sign. To this wicked generation, he says, the sign of the Son of Man. Okay? Then he goes on to say that is, you guys, to the sons of God, says, you have such a wonderful preacher, Jesus is the Savior of the Son. Okay? Look, when Jonah preached, the people of Nineveh repented. Then they will rise, therefore, in the day of judgment, they will rise up and they will, they will rebuke you. You say, we only had Jonah and repent. You had Jesus and you did not repent. <laughs> <laughs> Something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up. They came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Something greater than Solomon is here. In this chapter, Jesus said three times up uh, in three different ways. Who he is greater than. Remember the first time he said something greater than the temple is here? Not the story. So he's claiming to an authority surpasses even the temple. So why are you like accepting him? You are honor the temple, but I am a greater authority. See, the temple was the center of Jewish religious life. Places for sacrifices were offered to the the city. But Jesus presses in his ministry brings a new way of people to be reconciled to God. They will not come to Jesus as a temple of God. The, 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 God himself coming down. But they honor the temple, the outward. They looked up to Jonah because Jonah was such a great prophet. He called the people of Nineveh and repentance. They responded by telling. But Jesus' message is even a greater message was not just a repentance from sin and then after that the people died of pain, right? Jesus' message of repentance and salvation was even greater. Forgiveness of sin, eternal life of all of the living here, the resurrection from the future. And yet they will come to the of Jesus. So it's rebuking the uh, Pharisees, uh, Solomon, the wisest king on earth. And here was the queen of Sheba traveling all the way to listen. And I'm here in your midst in order to listen to me. That's what he said. His teaching surpassed those of Solomon in the depth inside of poverty. And his teaching offered the way to be reconciled to God and for people to find true meaning and purpose in life. Alright, what's the consequence of rejecting? You see, when someone has been given an opportunity and when the Spirit of God has come in and revealed himself, right? Because I'm talking about the constructive Pharisees. See, when someone, we're not just talking about deliverance ministry. I mean, we always use this verse to threaten people. You better make sure you receive the Holy Spirit, otherwise the demons will come back sad and I think you're speaking about a situation in which Jesus has come to set the house in order. And he was cleaning, he was teaching. And uh, when a person realizes that he is wrong, uh, something has happened. 
in a way that spirits control his life will be taken out, otherwise he will never recognize Jesus as God. But what? He finds that the house is coming filled in. Jesus had done the work of revelation. They know who it is, but they didn't fill it with himself, with Jesus. They didn't accept Jesus. They come, we find out the house is empty. It's still empty when God had done such a wonderful work. Then, the condition of the blessing is worse, seven times worse than when God had not been given us. Don't play the fool with revelation. When God convicts us, let's follow through. Okay? It's just, Jesus is saying, it's just like that in your generation. You have the opportunity to see me, hear me, someone greater than Jonah, someone greater than the temple, someone greater than uh, Solomon is here. I speak so clearly. You know what is God, what is not of God. You know me, you know me. And yet you say, I'm from the devil. When that spirit that blinds you is taken up and you see, but you don't fill it with the word of God with what I have said to you, it will bring some other spirits. You, will be, you are rejecting what is a revealed truth. And you end up being seven times worse. That's why the, uh, the, the Jewish nation had to go through two thousand over years of judgment for the people of God. So in a sense, when the person is delivered of an unclean spirit, he must fill his house with the Spirit of God, otherwise his final state is worse than his first. Finally, that's the result of rejecting Jesus. The result of accepting Jesus this is a very simple plan, right? While he was still speaking, his mother and brother stand outside asking to see him, but he told the man who told him about that, who is my brother, who my who is my sister. Sounds like Jesus was not very yeah. <laughs> Like for example, the turning water into wine, right? You know, and Mary went to Jesus and said, you know, they have no they have uh, they have no sort of like uh, wine anymore. And then Jesus said, what have I got to do with you, woman? <laughs> but actually, it's a phrase of respect. But Jesus is actually saying this. In the kingdom of God, yeah, whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and my mother. As far as Jesus is concerned, if you do his will, you are his brother and his sister. That's the kingdom of God. Let me just close the door.